morning to all comebacks watching from the fuck you page welcome to another episode of political hard talk with your host none other than dojan does no this morning we are gonna get straight tonight in the people we are get straight tonight so we're not to deal with the people talking we just all get straight tonight you know, uh, the high interest rate policy of, of Omar and the PNP has been one of the most destructive forces in the history of Jamaica's economy. It led to the financial sector collapse, where over 40 financial institutions went. Entrepreneurs that previously had been heralded by him, many of them are, some of them are exiles abroad now. Many entrepreneurs lost their businesses. Many companies that were over 100 years old in Jamaica were destroyed and sold to foreigners. That is the legacy. And even one of his colleagues who sits in this room today described it as the greatest transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich since the abolition of slavery. The financial shock, which began in 1991 in Jamaica, ballooned unchecked over the next five years until it, it exploded with a catastrophic bang in 1996. The explosion left shrapnel scattered over the financial landscape, which still impacted on the economy um, so many years later. My sister Valerie Dixon, she... So, so <laughs> what I want to bring up this morning is yes. that a lot of people do not understand where this thing came from. And I want to just read a little mm -hmm. from an, an appendix that was written in the Observer some time ago, it says, when Omar Davis, then PNP finance minister in the 1990s, began the process of dismantling the Central National Bank, it was done immediately after the Don Crawford run entity had bought a significant sum of US dollars at a few dollars more than the price that the official exchange rate indicated. The bank did nothing which other banks were not doing in a time when an inept PNP government was struggling with managing a market economy which it knew little or nothing about. What the sale of those dollars did was reveal that the very same finance ministry was covertly, that means underground, dispatching agents with huge stacks of cash in the trunks of their cars to buy U.S. dollars at prices above the official exchange rate. The money was stolen eventually. With blood rushing to its head, when this action was revealed, an embarrassed PNP government set about withdrawing public funds from the Central National Bank, making it publicly known. And in the process, it started or triggered a run on the bank, which was seemingly designed to end its life. Mm -hmm. That, however, is a sad history for the most progressive bank existing in Jamaica at that at that time. Mm -hmm. Because although I came into the party through Dr. Omar Davis, because I knew him in the financial sector, where I had been like one of the leading corporate lawyers in Jamaica and very involved in... A few people that were on the live, and she wrote the live for me there, though. financial engineering and so in when he was Minister of Finance a lot of the things that required industry input I was one of the representatives of the industry that he would deal with I got to know him through that and I and that, that's how I got into the PNP really through my relation with him whilst most people know Mark because of his being a, a top lawyer and a key man in the financial sector. Comrades, this man is all wrong. He's multifaceted. 
on November 7th, I want you, comrades, to join me and go with Golden. Explain to us, explain to us uh, Val, what, what did the government do exactly? What, because we only talk about the FinSAC debacle, what exactly are we talking about? Okay. You went to your bed last night and interest rate, let's say for argument's sake, is at 30%. You wake up this morning and you see an, a headline in the, paper, in the newspaper that says, government to increase interest rate to 64%. Mm -hmm. Please tell me which business would be able to fill that gap between paying interest rate at 30% and suddenly jump with no notice to paying interest rate at 60 and probably more. Interest um, overdraft interest rate went up overnight mm. to 120%. Mm. And, 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 the impact, and the impact of, 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 of that action on businesses was what you are describing. That is exactly what I'm describing. Mm -hmm. So how is it that these people who are running business for over all these decades suddenly overnight become bad debtors? Mm -hmm. Do, do you see the point I'm making there? Yes, as a matter of fact, we were villainized. Yes, we were hounded down like common criminals, and we had to watch our businesses go up in smoke. Yes. While foreign investors came in, they got tax breaks, they got tax holidays, and we were what? Flung mm -hmm. aside and discarded as rubbish. Yes. We were called bad debtors. As a, um, that after more than a century mm -hmm. of successful Jamaican businesses, the 1990s ushered in a period in which the positive relationship between productive entrepreneurs and their financial partners or banks came to a crashing halt. Thousands of healthy Jamaican businesses some of which have grown to become regional and world beaters were disdainfully discarded by our national economic stewards as bad debtors. Because although I came into the party through Dr. Omar Davis, because I knew him in the financial sector, where I had been like one of the leading corporate lawyers in Jamaica and very involved in financial engineering, and so in when he was Minister of Finance, a lot of the things that required industry input, I was one of the representatives of the industry that he would deal with. I got to know him through that. And, I, and that, that's how I got into the PNP really, through my relation with him. I don't know if I'm clear. We don't have to bring it up on our papayas. We've done my mind money already. Now, big people are in this country. Big people are in this country. Why is most people know Mark? Because of his being a, a top lawyer and a key man in the financial sector. Comrades, this man is all wrong. He's multifaceted. On November 7th, I want you, comrades, to join me and go with Golden. Can you imagine a man who has never earned the, the reputation of being an entrepreneur, does not know what it is to find a pay bill when you have men waiting on that pay bill to go home to feed them family. And that man who has never made a pay bill in his life going to look at people who have 50 years experience as entrepreneur, black entrepreneur who built country since independence and you will look on them and style them as bad letters. You know, Omar Davis really just have a lot to say to, he has not yet made, he needs to one apologize, but he also, and he was the finance minister at the time, and this is why I'm identifying him, but he really does have to stand up before he dies and talk to those survivors, talk to those victims, some kill themselves, some committed suicide. This is how serious this was. Talk to the Jamaican entrepreneurs, the black people in Jamaica, who suffered so as a result of those um, uh, um, the, the, of, of FinSAC and making peace 
with God and the ancestors. So I came into the party through Dr. Omar Davis because I knew him in the financial sector where I had been like one of the leading corporate lawyers in Jamaica and very involved in financial engineering. And so in, when he was Minister of Finance, a lot of the things that required industry input, I was one of the representatives of the industry that he would deal with. I got to know him through that. And, I, and that, that's how I got into the TNT really, through my relation with him. The Minister of Finance is more worried about appeasing the credit rating agencies and the capital markets than providing relief for the suffering people of Jamaica. We can always recover lost ground in our effort to lower debt when the crisis has passed. The plan is to reduce the public debt as rapidly as possible to 60% of GDP by March 2028. We believe that Jamaica can afford to slow the pace of debt reduction at this time and use those resources to help the people get through these most difficult times. It is time to focus on helping our people. It is not the time for excessive fiscal conservatism. One thing I love about the Jamaican people is their ability to identify a puppy show. <laughs> well, you know the real irony of the situation, Madam Speaker? You know the real irony? These are fiscal rules that the opposition leader and myself, among several other senators at the time, helped to put in place. And in opposition, I supported the then government's introduction of the amendments to the fiscal and audit administration act that strengthened Jamaica's fiscal rules. Mark Golding piloted those amendments in the Senate, and I supported it. So as Minister of Finance, I am abiding by the laws that he and I helped to put in place, and he seeks to label me for doing that. Now that's what you call an irony, but some people would even call it hypocrisy. You really think that Jamaican people can't reason, don't you? Opposition leader cannot, on one hand, claim the high ground of having helped to strengthen Jamaica's fiscal rules. Right? He can't claim the high ground of, of strengthening the fiscal rules. And then another, make a proposal, slow the pace of debt reduction, what do we call it, that if applied, would imply an abandonment of them. Choose what you want. You can't occupy both positions. But based on the irresponsibility of some of the utterances from Mr. Golding, I'm not so sure we can conclude that his legacy is safe. I swear by Al Almighty God that the evidence I shall give in this inquiry that the evidence that I shall give in this inquiry shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth thank you thank you mr crawford no um you are represented here today by mr anthony levy am i correct yes sir okay we do have um a statement that we received and therefore I'm going to ask the, your attorney to take over at this time and take you through your statement. Mr. Chairman, before I do that, I think um, Mr. Crawford has some introductory remarks which he wishes to make. He's not bound by, limited only to the statement. He's here to give evidence of the truth, nothing but the truth. Go ahead, Mr. Crawford. Yes, it has been 15 years, as we're aware of the problems we've had with, the, with Central National Group and indeed the entire financial sector. And um, there are many persons aged 20, 30, 30 years old or over who, uh, who may not be aware, particularly those below 30 years, as to what we are here for today as it relates to the life of Century. And therefore I just wanted to just play a brief clip, a, just a five minute clip, Century National Bank opened its ninth branch in halfway through recently. This addition to the CNB chain shows rapid growth and development within Jamaica's banking industry. The bank is close to the anniversary, presenting the new branch to the 
gathering was Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of CNB, Mr. Don Crawford. Our pursuit and commitment to quality service, integrity, sound nation building, and national strength is enshrined in our matter, reaching further, doing more. We have trained our staff at this new location to take care of your needs. We have, as of today, agreed to open on a Saturday at halfway tree, 9 to, 9 to 1. This is a commercial. I think Jamaica needs better service, and we are proud of what we have done to date. And we are hoping that we will be able to maintain the pace, reaching further, doing more. We intend make century the best in the business. We intend to, to reach other milestones with dignity, with integrity, and with fortitude. Governor of the Bank of Jamaica, Mr. Jacques Boussiers, told the gathering that it is heartening to see the expansion and diversification of the banking system and applauded the rapid development of CNB. But Century National Bank has been innovative in many fields. For example, it's the first bank that has opened, that has offered to its clients the, uh, the daily interest calculation account on savings and current account, as well as the uh, for the senior citizen compound monthly interest. What is interesting is that by the location, by choosing the location to build a branch here on Aqui Tree, Century National Bank is also showing that he is not afraid of competition, and I'm sure that it will be willing to provide and continue to make the, the banking system in Jamaica, Jamaica more vibrant by offering new services to the tourist and the business community so that the, that the business community in Jamaica and the population in general would be well served by a vibrant banking system. Guest speaker at the event, Dr. Omar Davies, Minister of Finance and Planning, said there was a need for greater investment in human capital and congratulated CNB on their role in doing just that within the sector. So if I were to create an institution, if I were asked to create a, from scratch an institution, the shake of the banking community that I'd have created CNB, because there is a need, there is a need for us to understand the true meaning of liberalization and competition in the Jamaican economy. Many, for many, it represents a liberalization in terms of access to their foreign exchange and access to purchase whatever they wish, but not in terms of shaking up the status quo. And having an institution led by someone like Don Crawford here in the, in, this, in, in the banking community to sort of shake the established foundations and say, I am here and I'm going to compete in terms of initiative and in terms of superior service is exactly what the financial community demands. And I am saying that increasingly in a variety of sectors, there's going to be a need for institutions which are willing to break new ground, who are willing to compete on the basis of service rather than the basis of established positions. That CNB, that, that is exactly what the doctor ordered. Century National Bank. Further doing more. Your Honours, Commissioners of this Commission of Inquiry, the, the person that authorized this, in, this inquiry, Governor General of Jamaica, His Excellency, the Most Honorable Professor Sir Kenneth Hall, Prime Minister of Jamaica, Mr. Bruce Golding, Leader of the Opposition, Most Honorable Mrs. Portia Simpson Miller, Honorable Members of both Houses of Parliament, members of the media, fellow Jamaicans in Jamaica and in the diaspora, ladies and gentlemen, it is the same power that aided me in the building of Century that has made it possible for me to be alive today after 15 years of sustained battering, bruising, assault, and humiliation both by the actions of operatives of the former government and by the inaction of principals 
of the present government. The power to whom I refer is Almighty God, who sees all and knows all. Yes, it is the same God to whom we ought to be praying every time we sing our national anthem. And as we sing, if we need to be mindful of all the wrongs that has been done to fellow Jamaicans by those empowered by the parliament of our land, and especially the disgraceful injustices that have been perpetrated, and as a result of which I'm testifying there, perhaps the occasional reading of our national anthem, instead of singing it, may be helpful to concentrate more effectively on its words. Eternal Father, bless our land, guard us with thy mighty hand, keep us free from evil powers, be our light through countless hours. To our leaders, great defender, grant true wisdom from above, justice, truth, be ours forever, Jamaica land we love. Teach us true respect for all, store response to duty's call, strengthen us, the weak to cherish, give us vision lest we perish. Knowledge, send us Heavenly Father, grant true wisdom from above. Justice, justice, truth, be ours forever, Jamaica, land we love. By all intents and purposes, we are not, had it not been for God, I would have been dead long ago. That was the obvious intent of the five motorcycle gunmen, all dressed in black, who stormed my house immediately following an article Dr. Davis publicly gave, but perhaps more, even more ominous was the response of the police to the attack, which they were convinced had political backing and support. If the intent of the judiciary of Jamaica, working in tandem with the government of the day, was to destroy my family and myself, it would not have used, it and could not have used a more potent strategy than through Justice Fanton on October the 2nd, 1996, to have issued an ominous ex parte or lopsided Mareva injunction that froze all personal and business assets of myself and family without the clearly articulated standard provision living and legal expenses relief for the victims of the order. Le leading legal luminaries in Jamaica and abroad have described the content and style of the ex parte order or injunction imposed on me to be highly irregular at best. In fact, the commissioners will take great interest in the content and style of the Mareva that was imposed on Dr. Paul Chen Yang. That injunction made specific provision for living expenses as well as legal expenses of Dr. Paul Chen Yang. And when the plaintiff tried to reverse the decision in the court, they lost the appeal. Though in this case, the perpetrator was the court and not FinSAC. I have spent the last 15 years exhausting all my family resources in the first year with legal expenses alone exceeding $2 million US. I spent the next 10 years borrowing from friends until their generosity and resources were themselves depleted. Then I spent the last four years living like an urchin, begging and crawling on my knees to stay in my family house, although I cannot pay the mortgage, enduring biting cold in winter and frying in the scorching heat of summer because I cannot afford to pay for the heat or the air conditioning. Only the very basic foods I have been able to scavenge. Hefty medical bills incurred by my dependent family have had to be ignored and all 
as the in, and all and much more, the indignity to which I have been subjected continues to roll on. And while my family and myself lead extremely marginalized lives, political predators in Jamaica feast lavishly on the products of the blood, sweat, and tears of my entire family. That includes my 91-year-old mother, who sits to my right here. And so, it is against this background that I'm very grateful. The high interest rate... <clears throat> so guys, may I stop the video there, so... Um, I don't know, many of you probably weren't on here when the video started, but... There have been some serious injustices in Jamaica under the People's National Party. And Dr. Omar Davis, he has a lot to answer for. And at the very least, Omar Davis should apologize before you know, before in dead. For our listeners who don't know what we're talking about when we talk about FinSAC, because we have to make this connection back, because it's always about the FinSAC experience at the end of the day being situated um, in a historical context. Um, it, it, the, 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 the observer writes about it um, to this effect that the financial shock, which began in 1991 in Jamaica, ballooned unchecked over the next five years until it, it exploded with a catastrophic bang in 1996. The explosion left shrapnel scattered over the financial landscape, which still impacted on the economy um, so many years later. Um, it, 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 uh, 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 Sister Valerie Dixon uh, is a survivor of that shock that, you, that, that, that the observer talk about, uh, a survivor of, of the, the, um, the, the government's response to, to the financial crisis of the 1990s and she has, as we have said, written her book um, Too Black to Succeed the FinSAC Experience on the phone lines um, Lady President of the UNIA Kingston Chapter Educator, author, entrepreneur and grandmother My sister Valerie Dixon She. So <laughs> what I want to bring out this morning is yes. that a lot of people do not understand where this thing came from and I want to just read a little mm -hmm. from an an appendix that was written in the Observer some time ago, it says, When Omar Davis, then PNP finance minister in the 1990s, began the process of dismantling the Central National Bank, it was done immediately after the Don Crawford run entity had bought a significant sum of US dollars at a few dollars more than the price that the official exchange rate indicated. The bank did nothing which other banks were not doing in a time when an inept TNP government was struggling with managing a market economy which it knew little or nothing about. What the sale of those dollars did was reveal that the very same finance ministry was covertly, that means underground, dispatching agents with huge stacks of cash in the trunks of their cars to buy U.S. dollars at prices above the official exchange rate. The money was stolen eventually. With blood rushing to its head, when this action was revealed, an embarrassed PNP withdrawing public funds from the Central National Bank, making it publicly known. And in the process, it started or triggered a run on the bank, which was seemingly designed to end its life. Mm -hmm. That, however, is a sad history for the most progressive bank existing in Jamaica at that time at that time mm -hmm. so if you withdraw money from the most progressive bank at the time what 
do you think is bound to happen? It is going to trigger what is known as a domino effect. Mm -hmm. Everybody, there's going to be a run or a rush on the bank for people trying to get out their monies. And we do not understand, most of us, what the effect or the repercussions or the consequences of such a run on a bank would actually do. Because if you affect one thing over here, it is going to affect other things over there. All right, so that takes us, that takes us back to your own personal experience, which you wrote about in the book um, with Fainsack. Um, let us go there. And if you were in, you and your husband, you were in the construction industry. Talk to us about that. Yes. And I think the whole world understands that when you're in the construction industry, unfortunately, you have to be the one who is, well, it wouldn't be wise for you to capitalize that job you have out of your own pocket. So you are dependent on the banking system to um, finance you upfront because in construction, you have to put down the building and as you go along, you can then certify that the work is done so you can get paid from the, from the client. But in the meantime, you have your expenses such as salaries and wages, you have your utility bills, you have your suppliers, you have everybody to pay until you get paid. So when your bank collapses, which was Workers Bank, and you are now faced with not being able to get funding, what do you think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. Your creditors are going to be down on you. In other words, everything now comes crashing down on your and your only fault or crime was to go and borrow money that you must use because nobody's going to really, as I said, finance people's houses, building shopping malls, whatever, out of their own pocket unless you're one of those types. Mm -hmm. But anyway, let me just quickly go on. Mm -hmm. So you are faced with Hobson's choice, which is no choice at all. You have to give collateral in order to secure these loans. And by collateral, we mean you have got to mortgage something or give up something for the bank to say, you want a million dollars? Bring 40,000 acres worth of property come. Mm -hmm. So the bank holds on to that. Sooner or later, being signed or held at almost gunpoint, you are not able to get financing, you are not able to get payment from your clients. So you have to now go and seek every possible means. And one of them is to put your house up for mortgage. Mm -hmm. I or, or better yet as collateral again. Mm -hmm. I will just read quickly here what um, another one of the appendix said. It said, the tragic irony is that many of those producers and manufacturers in Jamaica, trusting that their government was looking after their interest, had borrowed, sometimes pledging their homes to invest in state-of-the-art equipment to improve their efficiency, only to be crushed by the high cost of servicing the debt, that is high interest rates, which are generally harmful. Yes. Many sought out new export markets to increase their sales, but lost them as their competitiveness vanished through government exchange rate policies. Many strengthened their marketing only to be overwhelmed by the advantages given to imported competition by the government's unwise, liberalized trade policies. Mm -hmm. And I'll stop there for a moment. Yes. Every time it is the foreigners who get the edge or the advantage over local producers and local manufacturers who are the homegrown variety. In the FinSAC debacle, we were in business for over 20 years. Another company was in business for over 50 years. Another company founded by our um, national hero, Gordon, George Gordon, 
which is over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And again, we ask the question. The government contented itself to believe that companies which had been conducting business successfully for decades were suddenly struck en masse with ineptitude, stupidity, and amnesia as to how to properly run a business. Explain to us, explain to us uh, Val, what, what did the government do exactly? What, because we only talk about the FinSAC debacle, what exactly are we talking about? Okay, you went to your bed last night and interest rate, let's say for argument's sake, is at 30%. You wake up this morning and you see an, a headline in the, paper, in the newspaper that says, government to increase interest rate to 64%. Mm -hmm. Please tell me which business would be able to fill that gap between paying interest rate at 30% and suddenly jump with no notice to pay an interest rate at 60 and probably more interest um overdraft interest rate went up overnight mm -hmm. to a hundred and twenty percent and the, the impact and the impact of of, of of that action on businesses was what you are describing that is exactly what i'm describing mm -hmm. so how is it that these people who are running business for over all these decades suddenly overnight become bad debtors? Mm -hmm. do, do you see the point I'm making there? Yes, as a matter of fact, we were villainized. Yes. We were hounded down like common criminals. And we had to watch our businesses go up in smoke. Mm -hmm. While foreign investors came in, they got tax breaks. They got tax holidays, and we were what? Mm -hmm. Sung aside and discarded as rubbish. Okay. We were called bad debtors. As a matter of fact, for those who, who have a copy of the book, um, they, they, you'll see that the appendix, uh, appendix F, uh, anatomy of the FinSA debtor, which is, was published in the Sunday Gleaner, um, 2011, July 10 by, um, Claude Clark, guest columnist, starts out by saying, and I don't know if you have that, you can read that for us, Val, where he says part of the fallout from the FinSA folly has been the summary dismissal of the thousands of productive Jamaican businesses, business persons as bad debtors. And this is what you're saying. Yes, um, that after more than a century mm -hmm. of successful Jamaican businesses, the 1990s ushered in a period in which the positive relationship between productive entrepreneurs and their financial partners or banks came to a crashing halt. Thousands of healthy Jamaican businesses, some of which have grown to become regional and world beaters, were disdainfully discarded by our national economic stewards as bad debtors. Wow. Uh, I, I, and, and by discarded, because you now can help us to understand what Claude Clark meant now, because I'm sure when it's, it's a long letter and he would have gone through that, but help us to understand what happened to you in terms of how you were discarded, how your family business was discarded, and the impact of that on your family. As you said already, I am a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I remembered my husband coming in one evening looking very dejected and saying, I have to take your money this month. And I said, which money? You pay, man, you pay. So I said, really? Long story short, he said to me, which do you prefer, material wealth or your life? So, of course, I just cut my eye and said, it has to be my life, of course. I mean, what kind of question that? He said, good. So, I said, what does good mean? He's going to take the title of our house and go and see if he can seek some money because the job that he's doing for the government, the government is not paying as the contract said it should. In other words, if the government owed him $10, they would pay him 10 cents or sometimes 5 cents, just for argument's sake. Mm -hmm. Now, you cannot say the government forfeited, the, for, forfeited on the contract because they're paying something. Mm -hmm. What he should have done at that stage was to end the job right then and there, but this is Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And the man has spent 
that he is building his business. And now to be blacklisted by a bad-minded set of people who don't want to see you prosper and do well, he would never get work again mm -hmm. in this country. Because they would say and tell the public that he breached the contract by ending the job before time, and that is why they can't trust him again with any more contract. Mm -hmm. Blacklisted, done with you. Mm -hmm. How would the man continue? I mean, this is his life you're talking about. Yeah. So, people who beat them chests and say, Who me? Do you see me title? Carry it, go wherever? No, sir. They fail to understand what it means to be in a contract. Mm -hmm. Yet, when the government did breach our contract, we, it was hell and powder house to prove to people that we were not inept, that we were not stupid, that we were not forgetful that we were literally destroyed overnight because of the high interest rates that we could not meet, no matter how many titles did in a shed pan underneath the bed. And, and, and to put this in, in, a, in a wider context, we're speaking and, and you've written about your own particular experience, but one of the things that you keep going back to with, in, in the book is that your, your experience was not unique to you. You're talking about 44,000 Jamaican businesses. 44,000 Jamaicans, they have a book to write as well. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. when you see who bought our assets, and I want to bring this point out quickly, we as the so-called bad debtors offer the government of the day to buy back our assets at 25 cents in the dollar. This is you. Mm -hmm. And we were refused, we were rejected. And yet they brought in a white Texan man to set up what I call a usury company mm -hmm. and sold him our assets at five cents in the dollar. And then you wonder, you know, that's what you understand, not even wonder. Now you understand why you have a 40, a 40 year to a public 60 years a moratorium on, on the FinSAC um, report. But but why is there no call, no serious, uh, you, every time I hear a call for the, for the report to be released, it's coming literally from your lips. Um, why is Jamaica side? So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, persons where, like this Ray Ray person, I say, so why the JLP don't want to release the Finzat report? Finzat report was partially completed and it was whitewashed because, you know, the PNP had buried it when they came back to government. Portia Sims Miller did that in 2012. See? So the government is looking at the documents now. And maybe, we don't know, maybe some things were left off fight. We have to go get started. See? So. But we need, we need an independent um, panel from probably somewhere outside the Caribbean. To look funny. And then. But just wait it to come, people. See? And then, on the FinSAC um, Commission report. Because most of us as black Jamaicans, we have lost it. We have lost our cojones. Go look that up. That is Spanish. Our spine gets soft like cooked macaroni. Mm -hmm. There is one lady, and I have to give credit where credit is due, Yola Baker. She has been the first lone voice in the wilderness crying out for justice. And I don't know if it's because she's a woman, why she was treated with such ridicule at times. Mm -hmm. and this, this woman, man, she don't know what she's talking about. And yet when you hear who is living in our house, you eye them open big like saucer. And, and you're talking and about these houses now that were sold by this Texan who came and bought our assets for a mere song and a dance and then resold it for profit 
And most of the people who bought our assets were well connected in politics. If I tell you who got my house, but I can't do that. Because you know how this is Jamaica. Yes. So you know, uh, we uh, have to just clear our throats around certain things. But this is a travesty of justice that should never go unpunished. And one, when you look and see what people bought our assets for that we worked so hard and honestly for. And, <gasps> and this is why I'm saying to Jamaicans, please read valerie's book because she takes us on this journey and one of the things that made me cry valerie when you first um told the story my sister you were in the studio and i read it because you wrote about it in the book and i know we have just a few minutes to go but that is a story that tug on my heart as a daughter as a sister when i read it about how you found out that you'd lost your house and and what you saw in in in, in, a, in a vehicle in terms of your clothes and what you felt and how dejected you felt and uh, you know that whole just the way you told that story and and how it's written in the book i i, I you know i saw the tears literally dropped onto the page as i was reading because i felt your pain through those pages explain that moment to us it was really our very very helpful and faithful helper who came in one monday morning i titled that no ordinary monday morning and she said to me this be just what number so and so subdivision we live at ma'am so I said, I gave her the number. She said, Lord have mercy, look here, ma'am. And she gave me the classified section of the newspaper. And she circled public auction, house at lot so and so and so subdivision name. And believe you me, my knee went weak. I feel not but pure crawly, crawly. I run through my knee then. I had to grab a seat. So I said, no, sir. My husband, I forgot to explain this. What is my house doing on a public auction block? Mm -hmm. Long story short, I said, all right. Well, I forgot to use the little education now where we get that my mother insisted that I should have and like a common sense. And we got, I mean, not know this legal or not legal, but at this stage now, I don't care. We got a real estate person to come and look at the house and he said he know the perfect man who will buy this house from us so that we can avoid having to have it on the auction block mm -hmm. see ya? long story short when we reach the lawyer now to sign the sale agreement if you think me did have crawly crawly in a mini back when we hear the news and now we're going to know who the real owner is going to be well, I think something slapped me back to reality. And I said, well, God, whatever this is, I surrender. Mm -hmm. Because I can't do nothing about this. So the lawyer gave us about three months in which to pack up with carroaches and come out of the people in place. Mm -hmm. This is after raising our family here for decades, at least two decades. It was now no longer ours. And you're talking about an upscale community in yes in you know shame to say right. it is a mixed community but a lot of upscale houses were there it mm -hmm. was really designed for the bauxite managers the expatriates the white people to live in this little enclave mm -hmm. but things happened in the 70s and they began to sell lots to upcoming professionals and we were among professionals. Mm -hmm. We called us, we went to university, we went to college. So we did all the right things that your mother would have been proud of. Mm -hmm. And my mother was very proud because mm -hmm. your education is now paying dividends. Yes. Look here, two days after we went to the lawyer, Mr. the the real estate, I get choked up, yeah. but I'll go on. Yeah. The real estate man come back and say, the lady says she want the house now. So anytime I'm nervous, I laugh. I say, oh, you mean no? Didn't we get extant to pack up the carotids and we set my few little plants and thing? him say, no, the so-and-so man said that him have to get the key, otherwise I'm not going to get any commission. Yeah. So you have to move today.
Mm-hmm. Well, me did have like a business with so me just looked on him and husband and said, well, I don't see how I can possibly move over 20 years in one day. So on the work it out. Here what the man tell me, say, this so-and-so man knows up two houses to rent and I must go and choose one of them. Well, you don't argue with certain kind of people in this country. Mm-hmm. So I went and I said one of them was in the same community so I would look at that one because the other one wasn't suitable. Mm-hmm. See ya, ma'am? When I reach what I think is the address is a truck that I see in front of the gate and there is my gardener giving instructions as to how he must come through the two column then without lick down the people them gate column. Mm-hmm. When I look in at the truck, this is to put through it. How them things they look like my things so when we miss the curtain, I mean drapery, wrap up with plate, wrap up with shoes, some sofa just catch precariously upon the side of the truck and I said, but what is happening here? So I turned to the guy, I said, what's going on? He don't look at me alone, he said, the man said, we have to move, ma'am. I said, but I don't even look inside of this house. I pass here every day. This house lock up how much years now. So how you mean you put in the things in that condition? He said, the man said, then don't give the key. Well, we are char iron by now. Go back up the driveway, for got jump in the car. Go back around the house, because the this man. When is this man now come parked right in front of me? See ya? Mm-hmm. I march up to him now, fire, snap, you name it. When I look on the back seat of the man's car, not even car, mm-hmm. car, I'm going to close that pack up from the seat right up to the ceiling. Wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. wow. So I believe you me, it was like Dunn's River Falls busted on my head. The eye water just gush. Mm-hmm. Hear the mm-hmm. man look at me and say, you can't stand about your holler. Me have to get my commission to death, to death, to death, and him say the wow. to death three times. The man just palms up my clothes, man hand on my clothes off his feet, and circle my clothes and burst past me down, down the driveway, enter inside of this house that I don't look into yet. Mm-hmm. I don't know where I'm trying to put them down and come back out and take another load and it went on till the car unpacked with my clothes and then drive off. Wow. Oh, God. Yeah. You know, uh, and that is just part of the experience. And I'm that just... was just part of what happened to yes. us whose only crime was to create employment for Jamaicans. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. when my husband was at the top of his game, of course, you know, you're going to have the bad minded people and who's the boy, the Dixon and this, that, and that. But mm-hmm. he was employing from the greed architect, the greed people come right down to murder or who are waiting to get in sen- sentence as the person who is manual labor and push barrel. Mm-hmm. That is the amount, that is the extent of what we were doing for our country as black people, as black producers, as black entrepreneurs. And this is the experience that Mythic Nigeria had to go through because of government and politics. You know, uh, when I see who get that house, I'm telling you, I am telling you, 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 said, you know, one but don't river bus again. So yeah, we we'll leave it there. You have said a lot in the book, and 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 we don't want to talk about all of the books. Still, we also, although we need to have the conversation here, but we need persons to go and get the book. We also need you to read the book, and we need you to make the calls and write the letters and answer questions in the public spaces. What happened to the Finsac report? Yes. Why the things that report on the lock and key for 40 odd years when most people dead and gone? That's the question that we need to ask. Who is the FinSAC report protecting? Why put it? And it must be a whole host of people who are being protected by in, 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 why this report is under, under lock and key. But it's one of the injustices that's a scar on the conscience of Jamaica and one that we want to ensure that on our watch, and, and all I, we do that, which we are we supposed end, I, to do. Yeah. Yes, 
comfortable and I want to end by saying that when you see the color of the people who got bailed out and when you see the color of the people who are under the same circumstances yes. and were destroyed yes. it makes you draw the conclusion that most of us are too black to succeed so the brown ones and white ones too white and brown to fail and we the black ones too black to succeed. I may not care who will argue with me. That was my experience. I lived through it. And even now, we're not quite out of the woods, mm -hmm. but it could have worse as the Boyer Street would have said. Well, one of the things you have done in the book is to, and that's why the book is a historical, is a history text, because you've looked at this from a historical perspective. You've looked at Molly Moo, Marcus, Messiah Garvey. You've looked at Leonard Howell. You've looked at Paul Bogle and those who marched in the Stony Garden. Um, in the in the Moran Bay War, uh, and 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 you've and you've situated Finsac and 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 the black entrepreneurs, the forty four thousand black entrepreneurs in Jamaica who were made to fail by being branded bad debtors, and now you know still, some and some some have come in. business. That's why we fail. Can you imagine a man who has never earned the, the reputation of being an entrepreneur does not know what it is to find a pay bill when you have men waiting on that pay bill to go home to feed them family and that man who has never made a pay bill in his life going to look at people who have 50 years experience as entrepreneur black entrepreneur who built this country since independence and you will look on them and style them as bad letters you know omar davis really does have a lot to say to he has not yet made he needs to one apologize but he also and he was a finance minister at the time and this is why i'm identifying him but he really does have to stand up before he dies and talk to those survivors talk to those victims some kill themselves some committed suicide this is how serious this was talk to the jamaican entrepreneurs the black people in jamaica who suffered so as a result of those um uh, um the, the, of, of Finsac and making peace with god and the ancestors Val, we'll continue the conversation and do you quickly realize that the black investor has virtually disappeared from the Jamaican scene? All we seen is foreigners. Huh? Well, what happened to us? We're going, we're and who wouldn't be afraid now as a black person to go back into business? As the question was asked, and by what the way, where are our collateral uh, okay. hmm? that we would have used again to get more funding to keep going again? Because As I tell you, is education saved us. Right. Val, um, what good? We're going to continue this conversation. Where can we get the book before you go? The book can be had at Kingston Bookshop, any of their branches, Seamart Bookstore in Ligony Plaza, and online, Kindle, and Amazon.com. And I don't want anybody to tell me any foolishness about, oh, you rich already, so then not support the book, because I've had that said to me. Can you imagine? <laughs> no, that is the but weight they, of the bad mindedness. They don't know your I am story. To let the millennial generation yes. know themselves and their identity. I don't care about money. As a matter of fact, if I could get this book sponsored, I would give it free to every Jamaican young person who is thinking of investing in Jamaica to make certain that they never ever make what happened 20 odd years ago ever happen in this country again. But without knowledge, you have your eyes wide open in the dark because you don't know that this country is being run by neo-colonials who bow down and pray to foreigners and leave black Jamaican people to scrounge and hustle to survive. Morning again, labor rights and comebacks. So here you have the People's National Party bending over backwards again to neo colonials in Bakra, Bushra, Masa, Mark. See? And they are edging 
And then want to come come do this again to the Jamaican people. Listen, we are educated to know in Jamaica. Every day we come here and we go on nothing but facts. We are educated to know if we do not make the mistake of allowing the People's National Party to take reins of government again. We are warning you, Jamaica. These are persons, black Jamaicans, who sought to destroy their own Jamaicans. And replace them with foreigners. This People's National Party, the same one kind of change. And the Mark Golden. These people are the one who never hears a Chinese come and them up in business and they not paying a tax. It is them that allowed that and that dear stewardship after they dismantled an economy that Edward Siaga left to them striving in 1989. See, we cannot allow. The People's National Party and especially under Mark Golden, who is not indigenous to Jamaica. He is a British subject and he will serve his master. He will be at their beg and call. Remember, somebody tell you today. Jamaican people open their eyes, especially the younger youth, them. Who don't listen to the old people, them. Them don't know nothing good. As since Andrew Wallace come, Jamaican people know good things. Regular, regular Jamaican people, me not talk uptown people. See? Somebody black down real half of my life. You must go half of my life. And person who is not involved in politics and don't want to be involved, don't come for our life, go somewhere else. See? Simple as that.